everybody. Let's see, there isn't everybody. Oh, hi, Harry. Oh, it's kind of fun to see people from last semester, too. Very exciting. And it's light outside. It hasn't been light outside for a review session in a while. And there's Brianna. And there's Ariana. Hi, John. <laughs> Some of your name. Hi, Emily. Some of y'all's uh, screen names are just a little too cryptic for me. I'm not fast enough to figure it out. I'm sure if I can stare at them for a minute, I'll figure it out. But hard to believe that it is time for AP exam review, but it is time. Um, before we get started, and while I'm killing a little bit of time, I want to do a show first period. Uh, I got the collage made for um, last semester. Finally, here's just a little bit of it. Let me see if I can show you. Um, it's really fantastic. And I'll be hanging it in my classroom tomorrow-ish once I figure out the placement. I have to move everything around a little bit. So if you contributed to this fine piece of work, uh, feel free to come to Trailer One and check it out live. Okay, so it looks like this is not going to be a huge live uh, following, and that's fine because I'm going to post this um, on Remind for all the classes to see. And hopefully I'll capture it and be able to post it on YouTube. I don't know why I haven't been able to do that for Unit 1, but hi, Jack. Let me just uh, remind you how this is going to work. So tonight I'm just going to review Unit 1 full out using the test review sheet. Um, that's about as creative as I can get. And then, um, from here on out, every Wednesday and Sunday, um, hi Jesse. um, there will be, there's already a video posted on my YouTube channel, Angela Schioli channel on YouTube. Units two, three, four, and five already have a video there posted. Um, I, I put those in the can in the past. Now I'm going to review them too. So what I need you to do is by Wednesday, if you want to keep up with exam review, I'm trying to model for you guys how... To actually do this so when you get to college you don't procrastinate to the last day and kill yourself so we're trying to just kind of pace things out okay and just activate your prior knowledge that's in there somewhere you just have to reactivate it and then build on it so you don't get overwhelmed and it's important to sleep between each of these review sessions so there is method to my madness it might seem weird that you know it's not even may yet and we're already reviewing for the test but um this is brain based research based approach okay so um, I need you to watch before Wednesday the Unit 2 video on my YouTube channel, and then I'm going to watch it, probably find some things I don't love about it, and I'll try and clean that mess up, and then I will take any questions. But this review process shouldn't be that long after this, because you will have already watched the Unit 1 video, and uh, the Unit 2 video on Wednesday, and then I will just clean up some messes and answer any questions, okay? Um, so, ideally, I would have, um gone over this review sheet before this moment, but I have not. So we're going to kind of rediscover unit one together. <laughs> so if you haven't looked at the review sheet, I haven't looked at the review sheet. This will be fun. All right. So the first thing about uh, the foundations unit of the course is that um, documents are very important. A few primary documents. Um, so we're going to refer to those um, as well as, uh, and I think instead at the top of the review sheet, they have all the documents. I think instead I'll weave them in chronologically as they occur, just to help you see how things happen over time. So um, the first thing we talked about in this course was just philosophical approaches, pluralism, elitism, and hyperpluralism. Okay. I'll cover pluralism when we talk about uh, the Federalist Papers, but let's just talk about elitism. Okay. Elitism is a philosophical perspective about political science that says that people with money and status and power have an inordinate amount of control and influence on the political processes of our country. And while it was con intended to be a republic where people are elected to represent their constituents, um, that because of campaign finance as well as the realities of how policy is made, that actually it doesn't really work that way, that a lot of people uh, who hold power uh, are more concerned and serve the interests of the elite. And so there's been a perversion, I guess, of the original intent of the Republic to um, be overly concerned with the um, uh, needs and interests of those who have money and power. Okay. And uh, they particularly would focus on like large corporations and globalism and uh, those kinds of things. Hyperpluralism is the idea that 
Um, government is just ever getting bigger and bigger um, because elected officials are trying to make everyone happy. And so they say yes. <laughs> they sometimes say yes to different interest groups because they want their support. And sometimes that means that they are doing um, contradictory things to make multiple groups happy. And that can make the scope of government. When they talk about the scope of government, um, they're talking about the things government is involved in. Um, and they think that the scope and size of government is ever growing. So the classic example from your textbook, if you recall, is that um, there were people who came to think that tobacco usage was actually a cancer-causing um, substance. And so they called on the government to um, help regulate that and require certain warnings to be added onto advertisements, which then meant that that had to be regulated and monitored by the federal government. At the same time, um, there were tobacco farmers who wanted some stability and predictability to tobacco farming. And so in the 1930s, we started subsidizing tobacco farming. So we have the whole Department of Agriculture, which is overseeing the subsidizing of tobacco growth and making it easier and more predictable for people to grow tobacco. On the same hand, we have a whole regulatory framework trying to limit the sale of tobacco to certain populations and under what conditions that advertising can happen. So that's just an example of how the, the government's getting ever bigger and bigger and bigger and sometimes doing contradictory things. And that's um, hyperpluralism. It gets at that idea I talked about where um, elected leaders want to make everyone happy, so they um, just keep saying yes to more programs and more of this and more of that, okay? All right, um, so this country <laughs> got off to a rough start um, because we were originally a colony of Britons. And um, a variety of things happened which led us to want to separate from our mother country, including the Stamp Act, first direct tax on the colonists, and Townshend Acts, and Boston Tea Party and the Boston Massacre and all of those things that led us to um, at least the elites in our society in our in the colonies to have an ever growing fascination with the idea of being independent. So uh, the first major founding document you need to know is the Declaration of Independence. It's written by Thomas Jefferson and it's the document that says all men are created equal and that they are um, or that they are created by God. And they're not only equal, but they are given the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and property. These are, uh, the idea that you have the natural rights of life, liberty, and property are key to the development of understandings in the United States of due process. The idea that the government cannot take your life, the government cannot take your freedom, and the government cannot take your stuff or your land without some processes uh, that are considered legal, and the same for everyone under every circumstance, okay? So that is a really big takeaway from the Declaration of Independence. And um, remember that he borrowed liberally from John Locke, who had also said um, these things, life, liberty, and property. Now, Jefferson changed it to pursuit of happiness because sometimes when we're talking about property, we really were code, a dog whistling or giving coded language for slavery, and he wanted to avoid that whole controversy. Now. I've actually gotten ahead of myself because the key documents that are before the Declaration of Independence include a debate between Locke and Hobbes about the purpose of government and why we have governments and should we have governments. So let's go over that first um, because uh, that is kind of the underpinnings of the mindset that Jefferson brought to his task. So Hobbes believed that um, man without government was in a natural state of war and that life was nasty. So he had a pretty like bad opinion of man uh, in its natural state. And therefore he thought that government, any kind of government would be better than that state of war that existed without government. He was actually pretty tolerant of like a monarchy or a dictatorship or something like that um, because um, it would be better than a state of war that existed otherwise. Um, after Hobbes, uh, you know, Hobbes lived through a very tumultuous uh, historical time period anyway, so we can, can actually forgive him his... His ideas were based on experience. Locke, however, wrote, and he's from the next generation of philosophers, and uh, he, he also thought that 
man was better off under government. But he did think that men were not so nasty, brutish, and warlike, and that um, we were born into a state of equality. And, um, however, that having government would just facilitate um, and help most people have a more predictable order of affairs in their life and would take away from them responsibilities of, like, meeting out punishments and figuring out justice and um, that it would just make life better for everyone if there was an agreed-upon governmental structure. Uh, he also said, uh, differing from Hobbes, though, he said that if the government was not serving the general welfare, it was not a legitimate government. So he actually believed that um, government... Uh, the the status of men under government must be better than the status of men not under government, and that held the government accountable for at least protecting the most basic rights of uh, its people. So Hobbes and Locke, for different reasons, both agreed that government was necessary and useful and that man would be better off under government. So then we began the debate of, well, what type of government shall we have? And for um, a long time we had authoritarian types of government, whether they were dynasties or monarchs or you name it. So um, it was Locke who said that your life, liberty, and property had to be protected by your government and you had a right to overthrow that government. This is also um, inspired by Rousseau and it's called social contract theory. So as long as the government is protecting your natural rights, you are bound to the government. But should the government not protect your natural rights, then you are allowed, in fact bound, to overthrow the government. So that whole thing informed uh, the Declaration of Independence, where he states the social contract theory, states what our natural rights are, lists all the grievances we have against the king, holds the king personally responsible for all the things that have gone wrong in the colonies uh, during his tenure, and then announces that um, we are separated from Britain and we will mutually pledge our lives, our sacred honor, uh, to this cause. Okay? Now, what's really interesting about the Declaration of Independence is that this whole idea that man, all men are created equal is never spoken of again <laughs> until 1865 in the Constitution with the 14th Amendment. So any notions of equality um, were um, h hard to um, find later in the writing of the Constitution or even their articles. Okay, so keep that in mind. Um, so, the Articles of Confederation. We win the American Revolution, we write the Articles of Confederation. If you remember, they were our first attempt at um, united government, and a confederation just means that it was like a loose alliance of states. There were things that the national government could do under the Articles, uh, like negotiate treaties, um, control foreign trade. Um, but there were a lot of things that the confederation, oh, the Confederation Congress, there's only one branch of uh, government under the Confederation. Articles of Federation. There's a legislative branch. There's no judicial branch. There's no executive branch. Um, every state could send as many delegates as they wanted to the, the Confederation Congress, but they only got one vote. So large states and small states had an equal amount of power. There are a lot more things the national government could not do under the Articles of Confederation. They could not tax. They could not control trade between states. Um... They couldn't raise an army. Uh, they had to ask for volunteers from the state militias, for example. So um, over time, it becomes clear that things just aren't really working under the Confederation Congress. Um, and we start running into some serious problems. Some examples of serious problems include um, Shays' Rebellion. So um, throughout all the colonies, it was not just unique to Massachusetts, there's also Bacon's Rebellion, but what basically had happened is we, we set up um, an elite class that was on the east coast of the Atlantic um, coastline, and the elites were involved in commerce, and they lived in urban areas um, somewhat, or at least part of the time, and they um, traded with Britain, and they were accumulating wealth and land in a pretty good clip. And then in the West, we had all these frontiersmen who were getting attacked by the Native Americans and living kind of a hard scrabble existence, uh, very disconnected with the uh, state assemblies and local governance that had set itself up in the eastern part of the country. And uh, for whatever reason, the East Coast elites decided to be a smart time to tax the West Coast frontiersmen more, not protect them from the Native Americans, and control the money supply. And so the rich guys in the East were 
controlling the money supply in such a way that they weren't printing enough money because they wanted the value of their money to remain high. And if there's less of something, then the value of it stays high. Okay, so it's just a basic supply and demand issue. The um, poor people start to rebel and they're not able to pay their debts and their debts are being reckoned by the courthouse where they're taking their land and um, their thought, the poor people's thought is, well, if we want to make sure that that all stops, we need to burn down the courthouses. And so there was this growing rebellion that was happening in several of the states and there was no ability by the national government to raise a federal army to help reinforce the state militias that are trying to put down these rebellions. So, um, it's a funny thing. Uh, after struggling to get the Articles of Federation to work, um, James Madison basically came to the conclusion that this really wasn't going to work out. And so he asked everybody to meet in Annapolis, Maryland, to try and think about how we're going to revise the Articles of Federation, but it was a bust. Nobody showed up. And then Shay's Rebellion happened, scared the bejesus out of all the like landed aristocracy rich people, and they realized they needed a much stronger federal force. And so when he again called a meeting in Philadelphia in 1786, um, lo and behold, everybody showed up. Um, and they very quickly and quietly began working on the um, Constitution. Um, they, they realized they couldn't actually amend the Articles of Federation because you needed unanimity to amend it. You needed 9 out of 13 to just pass a law, and you needed 13 out of 13 states to amend the Articles. And it was just going to be too difficult to actually do. And so they just decided to throw the whole thing out and start from scratch. But that was kind of a bloodless revolution that was taking place in that space in Philadelphia during that time period. So they locked the doors and kept everything top secret, and they started pounding out the Constitution. Madison is considered to be the founder or the father of the Constitution, okay? But obviously there was a whole lot of debate, endless amounts of debate that broke out at the Constitutional Convention um, as that document was being rendered. Okay? So let me see here. We've gone to the Declaration. We've gone to the Articles. We haven't really gone to the Constitution. We've gone over Hobbes and Locke. Um, okay, so let's talk about the... Um, key ideas of the founders as they were writing the Constitution. The first thing they realized, or that they believed, was kind of like Hobbes in that, uh, but really no surprise here, that most humans were very self-interested. So you had to create a government that would not allow for the abuse of power by self-interested people, okay? So separation of powers and checks and balances between those separated powers became a key element that was highly valued in there. Um, also, our founding fathers were men who had a lot of property, whether it be land or houses or stuff. And they were very committed to the idea that it was the job of government to protect property. So, just look for that. Um, nobody's property can be taken away from them without legal recourse being carried out or due process okay so um, Montesquieu was a key writer and thinker right before the Constitution was written that talked about the need to separate powers and so he's considered to be the most influential philosopher on the actual idea of separation of powers and checks and balances that you see in the Constitution okay um, ironically the whole social contract idea is not in the Constitution once the the Constitution was ratified, we knew how a country, we now knew that these states were in the Constitution, but there is nowhere in the Constitution where it explains how you get out of the Constitution. Okay, so there is no exit ramp for countries who are no longer enamored of their uh, being in the Union. All right, the other thing that was really big in um, the writing of the Constitution was um, about the fear of factions. Since humans are self-interested, there was this fear that self-interested people or groups would try to manipulate the government in some way to get control of it to serve their interests, not the common interests. Okay, so we know in the preamble that the purpose of the government is to provide for the general welfare is one of the key ideas. Okay, and that mirrors the idea of Locke, which is that if the government isn't serving the general welfare, that it's not a legitimate government. So um, it is important or was important to the founding fathers that factions self-interested groups not control or gain too much control of the government. So 
in the um, Federalist Papers where they try to get support for the Constitution, they're going to help talk about that. And um, I'll get to that in just a second. First, we need to remember what the different compromises were that were necessary to get the Constitution to even be written or arrived at. So there were lots of compromises. The first thing was about how the states were going to be represented because the small states wanted equal representation and the big populated states wanted population by, re by pop representation by population and they couldn't agree. So the Virginia plan was put forth and said, hey, let's have representation based on population. And the New Jersey plan was put forth and it said, hey, let's have equal representation. And the Connecticut compromise uh, proposed by Roger, Roger Sherman came to everyone's aid because what it said is actually we're going to have a branch of government called the legislative branch. And in that branch, we're going to have two houses of Congress. It's going to be bicameral is what that means, bicameral. And one house of Congress will be by population, House of Representatives. That is why we have a census and we have to count the people every 10 years to determine each state's representation. And we have the Senate, where every state has two senators um, in the Senate. Um, by the way, this the Senate is kind of problematic now because I think like 85% of the United States lives in 15 cities in the United States. So did you know that 70 of our senators are determined by only 30% of the population? So right now in the Senate, we have really skewed representation towards rural areas um, in a way that is starting to seem a little odd, but the only way to change that would be, of course, to amend the Constitution. So the Connecticut, Connecticut Compromise established this. One house by population, one house by um, equal representation. Okay. Then they had really big debates about um, slavery. Okay. The first problem was the slave trade. The Constitution gave the federal government the power to control foreign trade. And there was this fear that they would Oh my god, I'm tired. That's not good. Um, there's this fear that um, the growing amount of states that did not approve of the foreign, the international slave trade would ban slavery uh, or slaves from being imported directly from Africa or the Caribbean. So in the slave trade compromise, they agreed to give the southerners, mainly, 20 years to import slaves before they would cut off the slave trade. So the slave trade would not be cut off until 1808. And that's how they got Southerners to stay in the game and approve the Constitution because of the slave trade compromise. Now, uh, despite the fact Southerners called their slaves property, they also um, wanted to count them as people towards determining how many representatives the South got in the House of Representatives. And our Northern states were like, Oh, this is very odd because that would give the South an inordinate amount of representatives and would allow them to dominate the House of Representatives. So the next and really kind of disturbing uh, compromise that came to, not kind of disturbing, really disturbing, is the Three-Fifths Compromise. The Three-Fifths Compromise said that they would only count the slave population in the South and they would take whatever the total number of slaves was in the South and they would multiply that by Three-Fifths. And that's how many slaves would count towards the South's population and determining the number of representatives they would get in the House of Representatives, okay? Um, the final thing was about, like, who would have power? Um, who would be able to vote? Who would... And um, really, the Constitutional Convention just decided to step away from that question. And they gave voting qualifications to the states to decide. So the states were going to run elections they were going to decide who could vote. They were going to hold the votes. And the federal elections would just piggyback on the state election processes. Okay? So another thing to remember is that everything about elections was given to the states. Okay? And that's why we have 50 different electoral mechanisms in the United States and 50 different ways of determining everything related to elections. Um, in a way, it's good because it makes it hard to steal in a, a federal election. Uh, in a way, it's bad because citizens get very confused about what's what based on what state they live in and what states they used to live in and how it works. Okay? So, um, that is the key ideas related to the compromises necessary to arrive at a final constitution. Okay. So, the Federalists um, 
Everybody who supported the Constitution and liked it and wanted it to be ratified were called Federalists during this time period. Do not confuse those Federalists with the political party later that formed called the Federalists. Okay, two totally different Federalists. Okay, the Federalists decided it would be a good idea to undermine the arguments of the Anti-Federalists who thought that the national government was too strong and uh, wanted a weaker national government. So the Federalists decided it would be a good idea to put forth a huge marketing campaign. And that was called the Federalist Papers, of which there were, wow, under 100, but close. I know there's Federalist 81, for example. There were lots of them. And so um, Madison, Hamilton, and John Jay, under an anonymous ty uh, moniker called Publius, they took very specific parts of the Constitution and explained how they would work and justified why that was a good idea. And these uh, articles were put within the newspapers throughout the the land and debated by people about whether the Constitution was a good idea or not. Okay. Key Federalist papers ideas you need to know um, is about how they supported the separation of powers and checks and balances um, and also how they dealt with the fear of factions. So let's get back to factions. Um, one idea about why self-interested subgroups of people in America would be unable to get control of the American government uh, one key idea was federalism. Okay, so remember that under federalism, the federal government has powers and the state governments have powers. <clears throat> and the federal government's powers are called enumerated. The state's powers are called reserved. And they have a few concurrent powers as well. But one idea was that you couldn't have a self-interested group get control of the whole government because they might get control of the federal government, but they wouldn't get control of the state governments. Or they might get control of the executive branch, but they're not going to get control of the uh, judicial and legislative branch. Okay, so there was this slicing and dicing of power in America that made it very difficult for one group to control the whole board was the idea. Okay, there were other ideas about why um, the factions could not get control. Uh, one was that we have freedom of speech and freedom of assembly, and freedom of the press. And so if, in fact, people were working out of bad motivation, then uh, they, that could be revealed using those freedoms. Um, also that we're a very large republic and that that was very good. Um, one that we're a republic. Okay, so remember that we're not a democracy. We do not, um, people don't vote directly on policy. Okay, we elect representatives. Well, one thing they said is, well, in the process of electing people, we would educate the public. And that educative aspect of being a republic instead of a democracy was actually really good. Okay. Also, that since we're a republic in such a large territory, you couldn't control the whole territory. It'd be almost impossible. Um, so they saw the fact we're a large republic as advantageous to stopping the spread of factions. Okay? So these were all the kinds of things that were being argued in the Federalist Papers to um, support the Constitution as it was rendered by the Constitutional Convention. Um, so, it solves the problems of the Articles of Confederation. You can raise taxes. There is a separate national army. Um, there is now three branches of government. The executive, judicial, and legislative branch will execute the laws. They can control trade between states, which is very important. So, yeah. Um, representation is more fair because there's one house by population and one by equal representation. So, a lot of the problems of the Articles were solved by the Constitution. Okay, so it says on page 24 are all the national economic powers. So let me just run those by you one more time. You can show them if you book handy and you don't really want to look um, it up. Oh. First of all, we have a big problem. The national economic powers is not on page 24. I am betting... Page 44? 74? Hmm, that's embarrassing. Let's figure this out. I'm getting there, folks. I'm getting there. Hang with me. Thank you, Emily. I arrived at it just now. 
It is on page 47, not 24. It's not even close. Like, how do I even get that wrong? All right, anyway. Um, so the powers of Congress. Congress can levy taxes. Remember that tax bills start in the House of Representatives. The Congress can pay their debts. They can borrow money. Oh, yes, they're very good at borrowing money. They can coin money and uh, set its value or regulate its value. They can regulate trade and foreign commerce, trade between states and foreign commerce. They can establish universal, uh, uniform laws related to bankruptcy. Okay. Um, they can punish piracy. Ooh, that's exciting. They can punish counterfeiting. That's also exciting, but a little less exciting. They can create standard weights and measures, establish the post office and post roads and do copyrights and patents. So those are all of the national powers of Congress related to economics. Okay. Um, the states cannot pass laws that undermine the um, contracts. They can't coin money. They can't um, require payment of debts and paper money. Oh, that's kind of a bizarre. Um, they can't tax imports or exports. And there's something related to slavery that's not important. And that's about it. Okay. So those are all the ways in which the national government now controls um, economic issues, unlike the Articles um, of Confederation. Okay. Um, so let's talk about woven into the seven articles of the Constitution. So let's remember the structure of the Constitution, right? You have seven articles. Article one is the thing they were most familiar with and knew the most things about. It is the legislative branch. Long tells all the different sections, all the different powers, what they can do, what they can't do, you know, all, all up in that article one thing. Article two was about the executive branch. They didn't really know much about what the presidency was going to be like, but they knew what it wasn't going to be like. It wasn't going to be like a king. And it's a little bit random. It's pretty short, um, but does lay out the basic powers of the executive branch. Then we have Article 3, the judicial branch. Very short. Doesn't cover, like, major things like judicial review. Defines treason. Says there'll be some courts. One supreme, and then some other ones to be decided later. So Article 3 was pretty... Uh, <laughs> Lacking, we'll say. Um, Article 4 about, is about relations between the states. Article 5 is about the amendment process. Article 6 is a really random article. It's like national supremacy and a few other random things thrown in. And 7 is the ratification, uh, which states ratified. Okay? So, uh, woven into those different articles of the Constitution are some personal freedoms. One is habeas corpus. And that is the idea that you cannot, your freedom cannot be taken from you without you appearing and being told what the charges are and um, all that has to be done under the rule of law. Okay? So you cannot have wrongful imprisonment without being charged thanks to habeas corpus protections. Okay? It's part of due process. Your life, liberty, property cannot be taken away from you without agreed upon legal processes that affect everyone under the same circumstances the same. Okay? Then we have bills of attainder. Bills of attainder means that the legislative branch can't just create a, pass a law to say all these people are criminals. Okay? You, you, each person has to be treated as an individual and they're innocent until proven guilty. Okay? So that's what a bill of attainder prevents. So we don't allow bills of attainder in America. Then there's ex post facto. That means that something you did can't be ruled a crime later and then you'd be rounded up and charged with it. Okay? It has to have been a crime at the time you did it for to uh, for you to be prosecuted by the government. Um, they said that you do not have to have any religious qualifications to hold office. They said uh, that you can be charged with treason. They define one crime in the Constitution. It is treason. But they make clear um, what standards of evidence are. They establish you do have a right to a trial by jury in criminal cases. And, okay. The other thing that our founding fathers are kind of obsessed with is the fact that they want the rule of law, not the rule of man. Okay? The rule of man is democracy. But democracy scared the bejesus out of our founding fathers because they knew mob rule could be really tumultuous and have unexpected outcomes. Okay? So they wanted to have the rule of law. So there's all kinds of ways in which they tried to make sure that the rabble people, like the dumb majority, as they might have, they would never have said that out loud, but 
uh, I can say that in class, the, the idea of how we're going to limit the influence of the dumb majority, because uh, they did think that the people were a great beast. Okay, so first of all, there's only one House of Congress that the people elect directly, and that is the House of Representatives, okay? And that House of Representatives has the shortest terms, two years, every two years, the entire House of Representatives has to be re up for re-election, okay? So that is the part of the legislative branch that most directly represents the people, but also has the less permanence in the government, okay? Then we have the Senate. The Senate back then was not voted on by the uh, people. It was appointed by the state legislatures. The Senate did not start getting elected by the people until the 1900s with the 17th Amendment. So the Senate was going to have six-year terms. They were going to be appointed by the state legislatures. So they were going to be like the elite. They were going to have connections. They were going to have moral authority because they were chosen by the best men. And they would have six-year terms and less turnover and be uh, the much more kind of consistent presence. The other thing is the whole Senate never gets reelected at the same time or gets elected at the same time. Every two years, just a third of the Senate is up for re-election at a time. So there's this built-in stability with the Senate that is not true with the House. So the House is large. It's unwieldy. It has short terms. It's people who were of common means, who just were well-known in their states or communities, they would be likely to be elected by popular appeal to the House. But the Senate is going to be much more elderly statesmen, appointed by the state legislatures, and they would have a natural connection to the president, the thought was, that we let the House do what it does, it's going to be crazy, but nothing gets to be law without going through the Senate, without going through the president, so that these crazy people in the House can't have too much influence on the government. Okay? Um, furthermore, judges are going to serve for life, so that also builds stability into the government. Um, and the whole idea of separation of powers. So if the mob or the dumb majority elects one branch of government, let's say the executive branch, the other branch of government will not be so under the spell of that particular electoral outcome. Okay, And the judicial branch, not at all. Because the judicial branch doesn't have to answer to the people. Once they're appointed, they're good to go. They don't have to make anybody happy. Just um, apply the rule of law. Okay. Finally, um, so checks and balances, should the mob elect someone totally unfit or something like that, then checks and balances will allow their power to be limited. And, um, of course, there's also within that, like, the power of impeachment. Any government official can be impeached. Um, so there's a lot of ways in which abuse of power or mob rule can be dealt with and avoided. Okay, I'm not going to take the time to go over checks and balances, because, you know, there's three branches and they each have two things related to the other branch in terms of ways in which they have power over each other. But um, that's on page 49 and 50 of your book, and hopefully you're uh, in the know about that anyway, I would hope. Okay, the Electoral College is a check on the power of the people because the people don't actually elect the president. The people vote, and then whoever wins the popular vote, that helps inform the electors for the state. The number of electors the state has is the number of House reps plus the number of senators they have added together equals their electors. At the time of the Constitution, the electors were not pledged to abide by the popular vote like they are now in a lot of states. Remember, all this differs from state to state because the states run elections. But um, So it really was possible that the people would vote for one person and the Electoral College would get together and go, oh, no, 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 and then they would elect someone else. Okay. So that was another filter to help filter out mob rule, okay? And um, the other thing, they just made it really, really hard to get anything done in the federal government as we have seen of late. Okay, so you know, just to get a dang law passed, you have to have the House, the Senate hold hands, then if they pass that, it goes to the President, and he has to approve it, and if he doesn't approve it, you know, no, 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 no. So they made it really hard to get anything done. They were much, re they were much happier for nothing to happen than for the wrong thing to happen. And that's why they've built in such a slow, deliberative, multi-step process and checks and balances. Okay? I'm going to pick up the pace here. We're at 40 minutes. I'm only... Okay. 
Um, so, uh, the Federalists were for ratification, the Anti-Federalists were against. Uh, the Anti-Federalists finally say that enough of them will come over to support the Constitution if they add the Bill of Rights. And so the note on your exam that if they talk about the original Constitution, they are not talking about the Bill of Rights. If they talk about the Constitution in general, they are including the Constitution and its amendments. Okay? The Bill of Rights is only the first ten. All right, remember the Fifth Amendment also lays out the ways in which you can amend the Constitution. The first way, the most common way, is two-thirds vote of Congress and three-fourths vote of the state legislatures. Note, the president has no role in amending the Constitution or the judicial branch, okay? So, the most common way is two-thirds of each House of Congress, then three-fourths of the state legislatures have to approve the amendment for it to, be for it to become law, okay? There's this other option, rarely ever used, only once really, um, and that's related to prohibition, where a the states can all vote to convene a national convention to amend the Constitution. And each state has decided how they'll determine, how to determine delegates to send to the convention and all these things, okay? But once the national amending constitu constitutional amending convention is established, it's really, they pretty much do whatever they want in terms of deciding what amendments they support. Some think if we ever go this route, we'll have like a runaway train. Um, then there's also an option if the legislatures, for whatever reason, will not consider an amendment that the people really want. There's a process within each state to form a state convention outside of the state legislature, and that's different in every state as well. But there's theoretically ways to amend the Constitution that do not involve sitting legislatures at the national and state levels. Okay? So, it's a pretty flexible thing, really. Um, it's very, very difficult to amend the Constitution, okay? Last time we tried, no, 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 that's not true. The last amendment we had was the 27th Amendment, which says you cannot raise, Congress can't raise their own salaries, okay? But take the ERA. The ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment, was trying to guarantee equal rights for men and women. And it had majority support, but still couldn't get ratified because a vocal minority spoke effectively against it. So, now we all know that it's like really, really hard to amend the Constitution. And so there's a lot of ways in which the Constitution changes informally and in a not formal way. Okay. One is um, just changing uh, technology. So, for example, when we made the President Commander in Chief, we didn't realize that one day he would be able to press a button and send nukes all over the world and destroy humanity. Okay. So just by the mere fact that he is Commander-in-Chief and that technology has developed, he has become more powerful because of that capability. Um, we've also seen economic growth change and bring informal constitutional change. For example, um, when it was decided that only the federal government can control trade between states, there wasn't that much trade between states. Okay, People were still using horses and foot traffic to move around the globe or move around the country. So now, as a result of communication and transportation improvements, almost all trade crosses state lines and therefore under the Commerce Clause, the federal government has become much, much more powerful. Okay? Um, so these are just some examples of informal constitutional change. Also a huge thing was the case of Marbury versus Madison. So um, judicial review was not in the Constitution. Thanks to the first court case, Marbury versus Madison, it became understood that the courts had claimed the power to overturn unconstitutional laws. And once a court ruling established a precedent that exists under common law until it is overturned. And so we know the courts will never take away from themselves through a precedent changing ruling the power that they declared for themselves in Marbury versus Madison. So, the whole judicial branch now is informally changed, and they do claim the power of judicial review and exercise it, even though it's not in the Constitution. All right, also political parties are not in the Constitution, and over time, they have totally transformed the way that we do a lot of things in politics. Most notably, we had to pass the 12th Amendment to change the way the president is elected, because back in the day, the guy who came in first place got to be president, the guy who came in second place got to be vice president, and we now know that doesn't really work. So. We had to formally amend the Constitution in that sense, but also almost everything else about politics has been affected by the growth of political parties, um, even though that was not anticipated by the Constitution. Okay? 
Um, also, over time, the parties have also pushed the government more and more toward, towards the rule of man over the rule of law. So there's this pervasive sense of democratization that has happened over time, whereas at the beginning of the, the Republic, only white men with land could vote. Then it, over time, became white men without land, and then it became black men, and then it became women. And then, so slowly we've grown the people who can participate in the Republic. Um, we've also, the Progressive Era brought about a bunch of things that also democratized things to a great degree, like the primary system, um, the recall, the initiative, the referendum. Uh, these are all, I mean, the initiative and referendum don't exist on the national level, but they are ways in which we've all allowed for greater and greater participation by the common people in the institutions of government. Okay? Um, all right, now we're moving into federalism. Federalism, of course, is the division of power between the national and state government. Um, we have a federalist system, which is pretty rare. Most other countries have a unitary system where the states only exist to carry out the federal decisions, okay? Or a confederate authority, which is what we had under the Articles of Confederation in the Confederate States of America, where the states are powerful and equal and just kind of work through a loose alliance. Uh, but we have a federalist system, which means that the states have authority and power all their own that the federal government can't really get involved in. They define their own crimes, they have their own court systems, the states do. They have their own taxation systems. Um, so they, they have a lot of separate power and authority, and that is a complex system we've created called federalism. Okay? Uh, the effects of federalism are, first of all, the federal government doesn't control everything. Okay, there's a lot of things that are determined and happen in the states, and so there's a decentralized type of government system. Um, there's a lot of disputes between states and between the federal government and states, and that means that those are ultimately only heard in the courts. And so federalism does empower the courts to be like the ultimate decision makers and makes them pretty powerful. Um, also, you get great policy diversity in a federalist system where um, the states control schools and the states control marriage and the states control um, a lot of things within the state. And so you get very different ways uh, the states control gun control. The states control abortion laws. So you get a lot of diversity and it can be very confusing to people about what's what and why from state to state. Okay? But also the states can be the innovators. If you can't get something done at the federal level, then they can try things at the state level like raising the minimum wage has been done in Washington State and California, or take California's efforts to fight climate change, despite the fact that the federal government is not really on board with that. So we do allow the states to kind of be the laboratories of policy, um, and that's helpful. Um, it also allows people to access the government at different points, so there's a lot of ways to get involved in politics and a lot of people to call if you have a problem. And so it makes it more responsive in some ways. Um, diversity also means inconsistency. So if you're 18 and want to get an abortion in one state, you might have very different parameters to meet. Might need a 72 hour waiting period, might need parental consent, not parental consent if you're over 18, but you've got the idea. Might have to have an ultrasound, might need to listen to a heartbeat. Whereas if you're 18 in some other state that's more liberal, then you would have a very different set of expectations to, to meet. Okay. Um, the, the thing is, though, that there's also a disincentive for the states to be too innovative because they're always thinking that at some point, if it's a really big problem, the federal government will step in and solve it. So it does kind of pay to procrastinate if you're a state facing a difficult policy uh, area. Okay? Um, on page 75, it talks about distribution of powers, and that means, like, what are the enumerated powers? Um, the enumerated powers are things that only the federal government can do, like, um, sign treaties, print money, um, regulate trade between states, conduct foreign relations, declare war, um, establish federal courts, the post office, uh, those kinds of things. And then there's a tax, borrow money. So all this is on page 75. Okay, pretty straightforward stuff. And there's things that only the state governments can do. Like, these are called... Um, reserved powers. 
Only they can establish local governments. Only they can regulate commerce within a state. Only they can control elections. Only they can ratify amendments to the Constitution. Only they can um, control public health, safety, and morals. Okay, so the whole idea was like social relations should be headed by the states. We now know since the federal government's kind of taken a role in that as well. But um, And then there are things this, the Constitution cannot do. Um, they can't violate the Bill of Rights. They can't change state boundaries. Okay, so those are kind of laid out as well. Um, then there's concurrent powers. Both the feds and the states can define crimes and have their own court systems. Both can tax. Um, <coughs> the states can raise militias called the National Guard, but those can be federalized by the, the national government. Okay. Um, they can both make laws. Okay. Uh, those are just a few examples. All right. Um, so there are horizontal powers and there are vertical powers. Okay. So horizontal powers are the powers that are exercised within, um, one branch of government. Okay. And then those are vertical powers. I'm sorry. Ver vertical powers are exercised within one branch of government. Okay. And they can reach down and affect the states uh, within that as well. Okay. And then vertical powers are those powers that um, stay within their level. Okay. So the federal government controls just this, the federal government and the, the states control just the state government. Okay. So that's kind of like that dual federalism idea. Okay. Um, that is indicated by horizontal powers. Okay. Uh, the 10th amendment is the last amendment in the bill of rights. And it makes very clear that the powers not directly given to the federal government are retained by the states. Okay. So anything that's a state power is reinforced by the 10th amendment. Um, we know my long lasting issues with the 11th amendment. Um, I've never seen the 11th Amendment really discussed on any AP exams. If in your review text you've seen that, I'd be surprised because it's super confusing and there's been a lot of change in it over time due to court rulings. Okay. Um, the Supremacy Clause. The Supremacy Clause is in the Article 6 of the Constitution. It says that national government is supreme over the states when they have two laws that conflict that the national law prevails. Um, one part of this is the Necessary and Proper Clause, also called the Elastic Clause, that is in Article 1, Section 10. And it says that the government has the power to make all laws necessary and proper. Okay? This can be the point of a lot of contention over the years, if you remember specifically between Hamilton and Jefferson. Hamilton wanted a elastic clause, and Jefferson wanted a strict clause, um, where we had a very um, literal interpretation of necessary and proper. Okay. Um, McCullough versus Maryland helped establish that, um, if you remember, um, the Federalists thought a national bank was in order. That was Hamilton's idea. And the Democratic Republicans thought that a national bank was unconstitutional because it wasn't in the Constitution. And uh, the Federalists believed that a bank was necessary and they believed that a bank was proper. Meantime, in Maryland, uh, the state has started taxing the national bank, trying to tax it out of existence. And McCullough versus Maryland said the bank was necessary and proper, that it could be allowed to exist, and the states can't try and tax federal law out of existence. Okay? Um, then there's this whole issue of inherent powers. Inherent powers are powers that are not explicitly stated in the Constitution, but we kind of understand that in order for the federal government to do its job, it has these powers. Okay? So, um... One example might be um, the, the federal court system exists and needs to do due process. So, um, oh no, actually extradition is in the Constitution. It does talk about extradition. Um, why don't we talk about the Constitution doesn't talk about the bureaucracy at all. Okay? But it quickly becomes known that if we're going to execute the law and carry it out, that we need to have people who actually will carry that out. So the growth and development of the bureaucracy and like administrative rulemaking to help actualize statutes or laws passed by the legislative branch that that's all inherent powers. Like 
need that to make the whole thing go. So it's not stated explicitly in the Constitution, but it's good to go. Okay. Then we have the Commerce Clause. The Commerce Clause said that the federal government can control trade between states. And this was reinforced by the Gibbons versus Ogden case. If you remember, this is all about that ferry, the guy who's running a ferry between New York and New Jersey. And one guy had a state permit. The other guy said, your state permit can't work because it's between states and only the feds can control that. And that was upheld by the Supreme Court. So Gibbons v. Ogden reinforced the fact that only the federal government can control trade between states. Um, slowly, that has become more and more definitive. And... Uh, the Depression really helped bring that concept along, um, and it probably reached its height. Uh, they developed this whole idea called fiscal federalism, right? Where social programs, social safety net programs like Social Security, um, ultimately Medicare in the 1960s, Medicaid in the 1960s, all these things have been established, which allowed the federal government to fund things at the states and give the states some discretion about administering those programs. And eventually that's going to kind of reach its high point. Um, and the, the states um, are going to feel as if they are totally overpowered by the federal government at times. And that's why in the 1970s Richard Nixon capitalized on that. And he developed this idea called New Federalism, which is devolution. He said that too much power had been concentrated in the federal government, and we needed to devolve some power back down to the states. Um, and if you remember that time, we charted all those court cases about the growth of federal power and federalism through court cases. We saw a pretty steady growth of the federal government, but then it begins to dip. And the key case with that is U.S. v. Lopez, where the federal government started trying to get involved into what gun free zones were within states and finally the Supreme Court kind of said mm, you've gone far enough it's really not up to the federal government to decide if and how the states will set up gun free zones within their boundaries okay so we finally kind of hit the top upper limit of credibility for the federal government um, controlling things okay however U.S. v. Lopez and the devolution of power back to the states under Nixon and that was popular under Reagan and has kind of continued under a conservative era uh, has also run into its issues. There's, it's inconsistent because we've also had like the upholding of the Affordable Care Act, which gave power to establish um, um, a, a national health care policy um, over all of the states and even the Supreme Court upheld that you could be required to buy private health insurance to live in the United States or pay a tax penalty. And so that was a pretty um, aggressive claim that the Supreme Court made about federal power. Okay, So there's constantly this kind of t back and forth and give and take about how strong the federal government can be. Um, the states do have some things they owe each other. According to the Constitution, they owe full faith and credit, which means that contracts and licenses, well, not licenses necessarily, but uh, contracts, marriage, those kinds of things are supposed to be portable from one state to another state, and they'll be recognized. Um, extradition, so if one state needs to get a criminal out of another state, they have to turn them over. And privileges and immunities, that means that if you move to another state, they have to treat you just like everybody else. They can't be, like, discriminatory to people um, based on when they came to the state or how long they've lived in the state. Okay? Um... The states use their reserved powers to sometimes push back against the feds. We're seeing a great example of that right now with um, sanctuary cities where the feds are trying to more aggressively enforce immigration policy, but some states are opposed to that. And so um, they're refusing to enforce federal law for, federal, for the federal government. And then if the federal government wants to enforce immigration law, they're going to have to come into the cities and do it themselves. And so um, states that are refusing to cooperate with federal immigration officials are called sanctuary cities. Okay, uh, We've also seen that with uh, the integration of the public schools, for example, Brown v. Board, where the state governors tried to stop the integration of schools and the president sent in paratroopers to militarily force that. So we constantly see this kind of tug of war back and forth between the states about their powers and how they can use them to subvert federal mandates. 
Um, we've talked about concurrent powers already. Okay, so there's dual federalism. Dual federalism is from the founding of the Republic through uh, 1900, <laughs> uh, where the state and federal governments just kind of were like roommates. And then starting with uh, the Great Depression era, for sure, we had this growth of what's called cooperative federalism, where suddenly the federal government and the state governments were like establishing programs and the federal government would establish the, the broad outlines and the states would administer it. So suddenly they became much more intertwined in their finances and policies and administrative uh, policies. And so they became much more married. This is like dual federalism. No, cooperative federalism, I'm sorry, where they have to cooperate with each other to achieve these major policy objectives. And they share costs, and they share rules, and they share administration. Um, and then finally, I've mentioned fiscal federalism, but another way the feds work to try and manipulate states is through the use of money. Okay, um, There's different kinds of money that they funnel down to the states. The first one is called categorical um, grants. Uh, they're project or formula based where if you meet this, your state meets this formula, then we're just going to block, we're going to send money down to you to meet that. So that's the way Medicaid, Medicare um, is funded, is they figure out how many people in the state meet that requirement and then they move the money down to the states to administer the program. Okay. The same with like science research. Okay. You put in a application for your project and then they decide who gets the money and they send it down to be administered. Um, so that's a project grant. Okay. Then we have block grants. Oh, another example in this review sheet is Title I funding, which is uh, money that goes to poor schools and states. They just figure out how many poor children or people below that get free and reduced lunch in your state and then they grant down money to help supplement the funding of those schools. Okay. Then we have block grants. Block grants are the favorite kind of grants for the states because they just say, hey, we want to send you this money for public safety. Here, do something with it. Okay. And that gives them the most flexibility. The thing that states really, really don't like is unfunded mandates. Unfunded mandates are when the feds say, you have to do this thing. You have to do it by this time. And we're not going to give you money to do it. Okay. And that makes the states very upset. An example of that is the Americans with Disability Act. It said all government buildings had to be handicap accessible by a certain date, but it didn't give them any money to accomplish that. And that's expensive to put in elevators and ramps and rework bathrooms and doorways to all federal buildings and state buildings. Okay. Uh, the same with No Child Left Behind. That was an unfunded mandate. During George W. Bush's administration, they said, hey, you got to test all your kids in third and eighth grade on these standardized tests but they didn't give them any money to develop the tests or administer them or grade them. So, um, we also are seeing right now conflicted federalism where the states have done things that are actually in conflict with federal law, like the legalization of, mar of recreational marijuana or medical marijuana, but that's not actually, that goes directly against federal law, but the feds have decided to selectively enforce or just not get on that, situation because it's not a priority um, but that can lead to really like inconsistent um, enforcement because for example the Obama administration was willing to look the other way Jeff Sessions the Attorney General right now for the Trump administration he seems very motivated to try and stop the proliferation of recreational or med medical marijuana against federal law okay so I'm four minutes over I'm really sorry about that but um, that is unit one in a nutshell I hope this has been thorough and helpful, and I will try my best to get this on my YouTube channel if I can save the video. Okay? Uh, no matter what, it'll be up for 24 hours, um, and then I'll let you know what happens after that. Okay?